Hello, everyone. We are going to get started just a minute or so early because it ended up being this is a pretty big group. So we're pretty excited. So I wanted to go ahead and get the room open and settled for our program today. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself and sharing my screen. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I am the C2C Care Coordinator. I am located just outside Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, today, you are here for practical strategies for the care of film and glass negatives at one of our free webinar series. We're going to be running from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. So just heads up on that. If you need to dip out, though, no worries. We are recording today's program, so you'll be able to access it um, on some sites that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. If you have any questions about our program or anything else, I encourage you to reach out to me at the email address below, c2cc at culturalheritage.org. I always like to start the program with a plug for our website, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will see all of our future planning for webinars, courses, or anything else. You can also access our library of past courses and webinars. C2C Care has been around for over 10 years, so there's quite a library there. So I encourage you to dig around that website if you have a moment. Um, we also have links to our curated resources and a link to our community where folks who register for it can post questions all about their collections. We really look for direct care questions. So if you have a question about storage types, maybe an issue you're having in your collections, Post it to that website. We have a fabulous group of volunteer monitors and experts who will be there to help you find an answer to your questions. We have two homes on social media, where you, social media where you can actually find um, announcements on upcoming programming. It's on Facebook and the network formerly known as Twitter. Both of our handles are at C2C Care. So I encourage you to follow those if you're on any one of those social media networks. A couple of quick tech reminders. We are using Zoom webinar today. So as a participant, you have access to the chat. In the chat, you're welcome to say hello and where you're from, which you guys are already doing perfectly. So I appreciate that. You also have access to a Q&A box. The Q&A box is there to ask a question to our presenter. We really encourage you to use the Q&A box for questions, mainly because as you guys can see with the chat box, as it gets populated, it becomes very much a stream of consciousness. So if you have a question, use that Q&A box. We can track things a little bit better. You can put in a question at any point during the program. Um, I also mentioned recording. We are recording today's webinar. The webinar will be posted on our website, which I talked about earlier, connectingtocollections.org, and on the FAIC slash AIC YouTube channel. It'll be posted most likely by the end of this week as a heads up. Uh, lastly, we've also enabled closed captioning for this service. We have a captioner working diligently away. It's always greatly appreciated. To access that service, just hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Just a, quick, a really quick programming note. Um, currently, we have a meeting scheduled on July 9th, 2024, for choosing and using safe materials for collection housing. This is part of our free webinar series. Um, so I would encourage you again to go to our website and you will be able to register for that program. We will also, probably in the next week or so, be announcing a bunch of other webinars coming up um, for August and September, hopefully, and also some courses that we're working on. So again, Keep an eye on the community, keep an eye on the website, and you will soon see announcements on all of these things. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we are going to see about introducing our presenter today. We have Luisa Casella. She's an independent conservator specializing in photograph and paper conservation. Today, we're going to be really looking at pragmatic advice, resourceful solutions, and cost-effective measures to ensure the longevity and integrity of preserving film and glass negatives. Louisa, feel free to take over and I will see you at the Q&A period once it's completed. Thank you so much, Robin. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, it's a real honor to be here presenting today. I have attended many uh, collection, uh, Connecting to Collection Care uh, webinars. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here talking to you today about practical care of film and glass negatives. I'm talking to you from Ithaca, New York, which is located in the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation, who are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Uh, I wish to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, before we move on to what I will be presenting today, I wanted just to bring your attention to a few um, 
film and glass uh, negative related programs that you can already find at the uh, C2CT um, in their YouTube channel and, and, and the, the website. Uh, and they're listed on your list of resources, the handout that you were given. Just a brief background about myself. I'm originally from Portugal. I trained um, at the Institut Polytechnic to Mar, graduating in uh, 1996 and specialized in paper and photographs. And for the first eight years of my life, I worked mostly in uh, large collections of precisely negatives and prints, but I worked with a lot of negatives. I also did um, fine art photography training to you know, become better as a photograph conservator. And then in 2005, I came to the United States to be part uh, one of the fellows of the Advanced Residency Program in Photograph Conservation uh, that was offered at the time at George Eastman House, currently George Eastman Museum and the Image Permanence Institute. Uh, after that, I was uh, very fortunate to be the inaugural research scholar in photograph conservation at Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is an ongoing uh, fellowship. And at the time I uh, researched um, autochrome, the first color photographic process, the autochrome plates, if they could be exhibited in anoxia. And then after that, I've had appointments at Harry Ransom Center in uh, UT, Texas, and um, uh, at Austin, and um, more recently at Westlake Conservators. And I'm currently an independent photograph conservator. So just starting with the baseline, what is what defines a negative? A negative is a photographic um, image on a translucent support. The image tones in a negative will be inverted, so white will be uh, black and vice versa. And negatives are used as a matrix to produce multiple positives. It's typically an in-camera original, so that's what you will create in your camera. The support of a negative can be paper, glass, or plastic. And there are many variants, um, some experimental, many of them not. Uh, and I will not be covering digital negatives today. I want to call your attention to this resource on the right, and it's linked on your uh, handout as well. This is a photographic poster uh, created by my colleague Fernanda Valverde in 2005. You can actually acquire the poster, it comes with a booklet, and it's a really good, uh, concise, very well elaborated um, sort of timeline of different negatives and uh, aid in identification and preservation. So when photography was introduced, uh, the date is generally given as 1839. Of course, we all know that um, it started earlier than that, the understanding of uh, light sensitivity of metals such as silver. But in 1839 in France, uh, Louis Jacquemin de Daguerre announced the introduction of his photographic process, the daguerreotypes. The daguerreotypes were um, in-camera um, uh, originals that produced a, a positive and negative image, but it does create this positive that you see on the left here. When this was announced in 1839 in France, um, in England, uh, William Henry Fox Talbot uh, came out to say that he already had invented photography and his method was the salted paper uh, print. And um, if we think about Talbot's method, uh, even though the Gary types took off as a commercial enterprise, as a uh, portraiture, um, it's really the Talbot process that gives us the, the notion of what we have now as a negative positive. So you would make a paper negative in this case, he called them calotypes. And um, from that negative, which was the paper that could be wa waxed to make more, be made more translucent, you could print multiple salted paper prints. Um, just still in the, the, the background, historical background, Sir John Herschel, uh, who was a, a British, um, uh, scientist, he coined the terms photography, positive and negative to refer to photographic images. He also uh, was the one who found that you could use hypo to fix an image. So he was really instrumental in the history of photography. So when you have your negative, uh, initially these initial negatives like the paper negative would be printed by contact. So whatever the size of your negative, that is the size of your final print. On the left, here you have an image that shows a collodion negative being printed by um, process historian Mark Osterman, and the negative is being printed on uh, a gelatin printing out paper. But most of us and most collections, uh, we know the type of negative that's shown here being used on the right, which is a, usually a plastic supported negative that would be placed on an enlarger and could be blown up to um, many sizes of paper. So to print the negative, it's 
you know, at, at its most basic, you use a light source that passes through a negative and prints onto a light sensitive support. Uh, there are many types of negatives on supports uh, from glass. There's black and white, but there's also color negatives. So here as a cross section, when you think at the most basic, you have a translucent support with an image layer. Um, and on the right, you can see here what a negative and corresponding image. This one is more recent, but it's also uh, produced by contact because they're exactly the same size. In reality, uh, negative structures become a little bit more complicated. So as an example here, this is what a cellulose nitrate support negative could have. You have your, your cellulose nitrate layer here, which is a plastic, but then you have, uh, for example, subbing layers, which are layers that help all the other layers stick better to the plastic. Then you have your gelatin image layer up here. You need to add an anti-curl layer at the bottom to counteract the strength of that gelatin. This also has, it's called an anti-halation layer because it had um, dyes that became invisible after processing and a gelatin supercoat. So uh, it does become more complicated and all these materials have their um, uh, preservation and condition issues. So something like a, a, a gelatin will deteriorate in a different way that, than a plastic, than a cellulose plastic. And other layers you can also have are things like a, a varnish that are applied later on. Here's a timeline of print processes. So most of us in our family collections, in our institutional collections, we are familiarized with the different types of printing uh, of positives that we can find. Um, and for each of these uh, positives, there would be a corresponding negative. So starting off in the 1840s, you have the paper negative uh, that I just mentioned. Then the next process after that was the collodion, uh, white collodion glass plate negatives. And this, these were created in tandem at the time when tin types were being produced, uh, for example, or, or amber types. The uh, collodion um, image layer is sort of milky white. So if you put it against a, a black background, it, it, it's uh, viewed, uh, perceived as positive, but you can print from it, obviously. Um, then after the uh, wet plate collodion, then we had the, what's called the dry plates. These are uh, a gelatin emulsion rather than collodion and again on a glass support. And this would be around 1870s to 1915. And these dates are, you can still find people making collodion today, of course. So these are the dates that these materials were most used. Then after the glass plates, plastic was finally introduced. Uh, the first plastic used for um, negative supports was cellulose nitrate introduced in around 1889. And then after that, um, around 1925, the cellulose acetate film negatives were introduced. Uh, and these would be both in color and black and white. And then finally, uh, in around 1955, the polyester base was introduced. So why is it important to know all this about the different types of processes? Well, to care for each type of negative, you must know what they are and how to properly care for them. So for example, uh, a situation of a, a, a support that's glass will have, um, you know, glass deterioration. Um, for example, glass supports should not be uh, frozen. This is uh, debatable by some colleagues, but it is, in my opinion, they should not be frozen just because of the different response of the materials. Um, you know, cellulose acetate that breaks down um, into acidic acid. So it's important to know what, what you have to properly take care of your collection. So just briefly to show you, um, hone in on each of these processes, like I said, we're not gonna get into the paper uh, negatives very much, but these were um, rare, uh, these are a rare material. So uh, paper supported negatives were made by the photographer, they're handmade, and they were mostly used by what is called gentleman amateurs, which were uh, typically upper crust society men who travel to exotic landscapes and they would, um, you know, taking photographs was part of that uh, exercise. So these are fairly rare. That's not to say, you don't, you know, some collections will not have them, but they're fairly rare. Uh, the glass supported negatives, on the other hand, these become quite common. So the first of these processes would be the wet plate collodion that was um, in a prevalent use from 1851 to 1885. Uh, these would be hand coated by the, the photographer. And the reason they're called wet plate collodion was that they had to be uh, sensitized at the time that they were being used. So you see here, like I mentioned, this is an example of what the collodion plate can look against the black background. You can uh, encase it and it becomes an amber type essentially, um, or it can be a negative. 
And these are the images we have of the photographer carrying huge amounts of um, material to photograph and develop their, 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 um, their negative on the spot. These have marks um, of being hand coded. So typically the corners aren't fully coded. Um, even though cameras had standardized, started to have standardized sizes, uh, oftentimes the glass will have been hand cut by the photographer, so they'll have rough edges. So these are all uh, pointers to identify uh, uh, wet plate collodion. Um, oftentimes wet plate collodion uh, negatives would be varnished. So you see here on the left, the varnished portion is not only protected against um, scratches, but it also becomes sort of more contrasted, more um, saturated. But the fact that these had to be produced when you were going to photograph them was highly inconvenient, as you can imagine. And so a big development happened around in the late 1870s with the introduction of dry plates. Dry plates um, were industrially produced. So these are um, you know, consistent. So you don't have the marks of someone applying a varnish and things like that. They're consistently produced. Um, the, the, the glass is perfectly polished. Uh, they tend to have the, emo the emulsion tends to be a more neutral, um, a more neutral in tone than the, the collodion. Collodion is always a sort of milky, warm, uh, beigey tone, whereas the dry plates are a neutral black. Um, and here's when you start seeing companies like Kodak. So it was, it was big business to to um, produce um, the dry plates. But still, they were still made of glass and they were heavy. And so the, the next iteration uh, of negatives was the plastic supported negatives after 1889. And many of us um, still remember in, in darkroom photography, that's what we, we would have used with a uh, roll film and things like that. So glass plates, um, sorry, plastic supported negatives are indeed the most common in most collections. They're industrially produced. And these can be found in three types of supports. The first, like I said, was cellulose nitrate from 1889, thereabouts to 1950s, followed by cellulose acetate introduced around 1925, and then polyester, uh, and they can also be colored. Um, and there's many formats. And here I have a, the ad of the Kodak camera. This is uh, uh, what Kodak introduced that was so revolutionary is that you'd buy the camera loaded with 100 um, uh, photograms that you could photograph, and then you'd return it to the, 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 the shop. They would take out the negative, develop it, print your print, and fill it up again with another uh, brand new roll. So it's, it's definitely a consumer product. Telling the three types of plastics apart is uh, very important. Uh, a few ways that you can use to tell them apart. Uh, so what we refer to as plates are any uh, plastic supported negative that's um, on a format four by five or bigger, um, or sheet, sheet film can also be used. Uh, they'll often have edge printing. So as you can see here, it says Eastman Nitrate Kodak, and here it says Kodak Safety Film, and that says ANSCO Safety Film. Uh, so the edge printing is something you can typically trust. Sometimes if there's been a duplication effort, there might be, um, say that you duplicated the nitrate film onto a safe, you can have both uh, print, print uh, both um, text appear. And that, that's what that most likely will tell you. Um, a lot of people um, try to list notch codes and you'll find online uh, references of several notch codes that supposedly would be one type would be uh, safety, one type would be nitrate. But as you can see in this example, this is a nitrate uh, a film from Kodak. This is safe and they have exactly the same notch code. So these would not be able to, you know, it wouldn't tell you much. Uh, the notch codes were created. So in the dark room when the photographer was developing the negative, uh, when the notch code is on the top right, it means the emulsion is towards you and you have to be in total darkness to develop them. So that's why. Um, another way you can tell negative, so you can find a, a, a positive four if you have polyester base, which is the most stable base, is using cross polarized filters. These are Cross polarized, you can buy polarized filters in most um, photo suppliers or online very easily, and you mount them uh, cross. So polarized po po polarized filters have sort of a grid to them, a, a, a directional uh, lines, and so when you cross them, they uh, block the light. Uh, here, as you can see, I just simply tape them with clear tape, 
And then when you put your film through them, if you have polyester, which is the, the most stable type of space, uh, the light goes through and it makes this sort of like um, a green and pink um, rainbowy tone. And that's a positive uh, identification of polyester. Um, it doesn't distinguish between nitrate and acetate. To distinguish between uh, acetate and nitrate, um, there's a few um, methods. There's one that's the burn test. I'm not even gonna mention it because uh, I've only tried it once and I don't think it's very useful. The flotation test that I'm showing you here um, is done by, uh, it's a destructive test. So that's, that's already a drawback for this type of test that many colleagues prefer not to use. Essentially you need to clip a small sample of your negative um, and then immerse it in trichloroethylene, uh, which is a solvent that has a very specific density. Uh, to make this te test, you require personal protective um, equipment, like you need to wear gloves, goggles, a mask, and work under a fume hood or a trunk or with proper ventilation. So the density of trichloroethylene is such that nitrate sinks to the bottom and acetate floats, and then polyester just sort of twirls in the center. But because it's a toxic test and um, it's destructive, a lot of people prefer not to use it. Another method to positively identify um, cellulose nitrate is the diphenylamine test. I, I, put, I listed it in your uh, handout this uh, specific video. It was made by conservation scientist Bertrand Lavadrin. And it shows you how to, uh, it's also destructive, but a lot less. But basically you need to abrade the little corner of your negative onto sandpaper or a file. And then you test it with diphenylamine and uh, nitrate will turn black. And uh, anything that's not nitrate will not turn black. This again is a toxic, you're using um, a, a, a toxic chemical. So you wanna wear protective, um, personal equipment and also work under ventilation. So why is nitrate so uh, important to identify? Uh, I'm sure many of you know this, but nitrate is highly flammable. Um, in uh, 1929, my controls are covering the dates, I'm pretty sure it's 1929, uh, there was um, a terrible tragedy that happened uh, in the, um, the Cleveland Medical Clinic, clinic where, um, there was a fire that, that started in the x-ray room uh, where the x-ray plates were on nitrate. Um, and so this terrible tragedy then uh, started uh, all the legislation that was put in place for um, handling nitrates. The National Fire Protection Agency number 40 standard, uh, uh, which you can consult, you, you have to purchase it, but you can find most of the information online, um, is the standard for storage and handling of cellulose nitrate film. Uh, different states have different regulations regarding how to handle nitrate. Um, some states you need to surrender your collection to the fire department. In any case, you should most likely, if you identify nitrate, contact your fire department. Uh, some states you can um, house your collection in an institution with the nitrate vault. So, for example, near me, the George Eastman Mu Museum has a vault that they will take some collections um, if, if necessary, but you really need to check your. Um, the legislation in your area. Another factor that helps you identify are things like the odor. So for example, this is an, an example, we'll go into more detail about the deterioration of negatives, but this is the cellulose acetate negative that deteriorates by breaking down and the plastic breaks down into acetic acid that's essentially vinegar. And so the odor, if you smell uh, vinegar, typically that's, um, that's what that tells you in terms of identification. And then the color a little bit. So for example, the negatives with the anti-halation layer, typically the, uh, the cellulose acetate, uh, oftentimes with the presence of humidity that the anti-halation layer dyes will reform. So they, are, they should be transparent if everything is healthy, but they'll reform and turn blue again. So that would tell you most likely you have a cellulose acetate negative. And then there's the color of um, many nitrate negatives have sort of a brownish tone, but it's not, Really, to identify them, you want to use a combination of all these methods to have um, um, to be certain of what you have. So um, I'll leave the Q and A till the end, if that's okay, and I'll move on to uh, common deterioration issues on negatives. So negatives can deteriorate either by physical damage, chemical degradation, or environmental damage, and these are not again 
usually deterioration is a combination of all of these, but um, just trying to kind of organize our ideas, these are some of the ways you can put them into different buckets. So physical damage would be cracks and breaks and glass supports, um, scratches in glass or plastic uh, supports. Chemical degradation, you have the what's called vinegar syndrome, so the acetate film deterioration I was just mentioning. Silver mirroring of the image layer, and we'll look more closely to that in a minute. And then glass deterioration, like you, you see here, uh, where through the cycling of uh, humidity and temperature, glass starts to break down and it becomes sort of milky. And this can promote delamination um, and, and it just becomes sort of foggy. Um, and then in terms of environmental damage, the effects of humidity and temperature fluctuation and also light exposure will potentiate uh, several types of deterioration. So in terms of breakage of support, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, we've all seen things break, I'm sure glass things break. Uh, this is an interesting example of, um, this is the Hessler negative. It was treated at the George Eastman House, now Eastman Museum in 2005 by my colleague, uh, Katie Whitman. And the importance of this negative was that, um, you know, one of the cultural importance of negatives is that they were the, the object that was in front of the sitter when the picture was taken. So this negative was uh, in front of Lincoln when this image was taken. So that's that's um, why it's culturally so significant, much more than a print that can be one of many. So it's truly unique. Um, and here more uh, broken supports. The one on the top right I wanted to call your attention to. So this negative is around, it was taken around 1890s. And then this uh, image was made in the, 1980s and uh, you can see that the the damage has happened since the 1980s when this image was taken until now so it survived 100 years and then it was broken and uh, a little fragment was lost this is a, a, a negative support uh, it's, it's a nitrate that's showing planar distortion this could be due to a variety of reasons from um, humidity cycling to even just the pressure to being incorrectly uh, stored this is an example of a cellulose acetate support. Uh, so when cellulose acetate breaks down, as I mentioned, through the formation of acidic acid, it can form, basically what happens is the acetic acid gets trapped. Uh, and in this case, these little bubbles are uh, filled with this uh, acidic acid, either as crystals or as, sometimes as liquid. Uh, I've seen that as well. So that's what we're seeing here. And this is typically a, a result of a combination of uh, high temperature, um, high humidity, but mostly high temperature. The other thing to consider in deterioration is a lot of this uh, deterioration is uh, it, it contaminates adjacent materials. So with these deteriorated um, acetate negatives, most likely they didn't all deteriorate at the same time. There, there must have been a beginning of the deterioration. And so with inspection or um, addressing you know, isolating damaged materials, you could have saved some of some of those materials not to reach this level of decay. And here's an example of the um, silver mirroring I was mentioned, mentioning. Silver mirroring occurs when uh, the silver on the image layer migrates through oxidation, then reforms on the top of the image layer. Um, in this case, um, this housing was um, good quality housing, uh, a rag of paper, but because of this little cut, the thumb cut here, um, I believe it's because this part was in contact with the paper, so it was more compressed, whereas here, the oxidation was free to occur, so it made this mark. And again, here, the same thing. So this print was against the uh, negative on the envelope, so just the contact with the print prevented uh, the damage to fully develop uh, in that area. These are glass plate negatives that uh, there's a combination of things happening here. Um, so in this case, there's glass deterioration for sure, but that also caused um, the lamination of the image layer, the gelatin image layer. Uh, the gelatin image layer may also have, um, as, it, as it was exposed to cycles of relative humidity, could have also sw swollen and shrunk. And so it's a combination of, of effects here. And this is in the original housing. We'll get into housing a little bit later. So there's nothing inherently wrong with keeping some original housing, uh, but this is obviously um, a combination of many, many factors that, were, um, that, that resulted in this level of damage. 
So let's now talk about some preventive measures you can take. Uh, the first step when addressing a collection is to uh, survey your collection. So you want to, through a survey, which has to be a discrete sort of under a week kind of event, you want to identify what you have, isolate active damage. So if you have something that's, um, you know, broken negatives or something that's really starting to smell of acetic acid, um, you know, things that can contaminate adjacent materials. And with the survey uh, mold, for example, that's something you should address immediately. And your survey then allows you to take stock of your situation with your negatives. And at that point, you can make a plan and then move on to cataloging, assessing and improving conditions. And then you need to consider main maintenance long-term. So in order to do a survey, um, you can certainly do a survey uh, with the staff that you have. There's resources online and C2CC is an excellent platform. Uh, there's forums. Um, you can also contact a conservator in your area and you can also apply for a CAP grant. I'm sure most of you know what a, uh, it's a collection assessment uh, program grant uh, in which a conservator, um, you don't have to pay anything and a conservator comes to your collection with a, an engineer, a building engineer they assess the conditions and the building and they um, give you a report in the end with recommendations. So this is a program you should definitely um, take advantage of. And like I said, a survey has to be an efficient sort of under week uh, event. One tool that's very useful for negatives is the uh, acid detectors or AD strips. They're um, put out, they're sold by uh, the Image Permanence Institute and they're very affordable. They're about $60 for 300 strips. And what you do is you place them in your um, several containers or boxes or drawers. And uh, in a few hours, so typically overnight, you can see, you can have a reading of if you have acidic acid deterioration, what the level of that is. So for example, in, this, in these two drawers, these um, strips were placed in this, uh, at the same time. And you can see how this drawer has a lot more um, acidic acid being off gas than this one here. So you'd be wise to try and separate these two drawers or somehow isolate the ones that could contaminate adjacent materials. Um, this is just to zoom into the same situation. So this is in my own private collection, just to illustrate really how, um, how visually effective these simple tools are. Uh, this is the green strip is inside the, the, the plastic pouch and the blue one is on the outside. So you can see how, how uh, easy this is to, to use. And one thing I would say is that surveys, if you're not calling a conservator, if you're choosing to do it yourself, they can be very overwhelming. And so really having a, a, a cool head and just, um, you know, small um, incremental changes can make a tremendous amount of um, a, a positive impact um, and just, you know, take it a little bit at a time because typically negative collections are large collections and you can very easily become overwhelmed. So uh, reach out to resources that exist and um, know that you're not alone. You know, a lot of people have uh, large collections they have to deal with. Another thing that you can use in your survey, but also just as good practice in your negatives collection is to install insect traps um, around your storage area. I put, um, this is listed on your handouts. Uh, these insect traps are not so much to be used as traps <laughs> to kill pests, but as a monitoring method. So you can, you know, set yourself a calendar to look at them once a week, once every month, and you can count um, the, the, the increase of infestation, if any. Um, you can use the museum pest website to identify them, and there's forums. But a very cool feature that smartphones have now is if you have a smartphone and you photograph a bug, um, it immediately through AI identifies what the pest is, uh, and you can immediately see what kind of a problem you're facing. And so survey da data, uh, one of the things that can help you is to prioritize and plan, but it's also very important for funding applications. So one of the first things that you'll be asked when applying for funding is what's your environmental data? What are your numbers? What's in your collection? So you can get ahead of an application by uh, getting that data. Um, so after you do your survey, in terms of uh, planning, you want to define the goals of how you want to use your collection. If you want to catalog it, um, you want to have an emergency plan. That's a whole separate topic, but all institutions should have an emergency plan. 
Um, you want to look at allied institutions, so uh, forms like communities like the C2CC community, and just really don't be um, hesitant about asking for help because people are very, very happy to, to support each other. When you're planning for what you're going to do with your collection, you need to think of things like cleaning and rehousing. So if you have a very uh, dirty collection, you're going to have to have a, a comprehensive individual cleaning of your materials and also rehousing. Uh, you want to think about cataloging. Do you have computers? Do you have money to buy software? Do you have to do it in paper? There's nothing wrong with paper catalogs. Um, and you want to consider what environmental changes you need to and can make realistically. Grant applications, there's a number of grants for a variety of areas, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. And you also want to think about staff capacity. So who is the team you can count on, um, and do they need specific training? Because there's a lot you can do in-house. And then you always want to consider long-term maintenance. You know, many projects, uh, like the one shown here, the project I was part of, that a cold storage vault was actually built. Uh, this is 20 years ago, and it's since been dismantled. So um, thinking about can you maintain the conditions that you set out to do. Um, like I said, there's a lot of funding. So AIC has a lot of resources. This uh, database, Candid, is um, a directory for nonprofits. So this is a great place to find grants for an institution. Um, Candid is a paid service, but most uh, public libraries will have um, um, a subscription to Candid. And they also have, you can go on their website and find the closest um, access point to you. Um, I'm upstate New York, so we, for example, have a very uh, good uh, program from the Greater Hudson Heritage Network, and they have a supplies grant that you can buy boxes and envelopes with. They also have a conservation treatment grant. So I'm sure many areas around the other country and hopefully around the world will have um, similar funding opportunities. In terms of cataloging, um, you know, you, you could go with, a, there's, you know, large database companies that specialize in museums, but many institutions can't afford something like that, or your collection just doesn't need it. Uh, so you want to look into um, how you want to do cataloging, what's the scope, what's the use of your collection, and what resources do you have. So say that you uh, subscribe to one of these uh, tools, and then if you can't maintain it, that defies the purpose. So, uh, and like I said, a paper catalog is nothing to be sneered at. It works um, if your collection is small enough, or if that's all you can do, uh, that it's fine. We had paper catalogs for a long time. Um, environmental conditions are a, a big aspect of good preservation. So, when you're looking at assessing, you know, after you've done your survey, collected data. You want to look at the environment, so temperature, relative humidity, um, ventilation. You also want to look at the storage uh, conditions that you have, boxes, what shelves do you have, and then individ individual housing. Do you have original housing? Can you afford new housing? Um, infestations are part of your conditions, so cleanliness, ventilation, uh, isolation of the storage space, the space. And then finally, you want to look at the item duration. So focusing in on the environment, um, this is a big, um, you know, working, improving your environment and maintaining it. It's a big commitment, it's a big, big investment, as most of us know. And in ge very general terms, um, for negatives, just to, to keep a happy medium that all items in a collection would be happy with, you want to aim for 70 Fahrenheit degrees or below. Um, in my opinion, you should not freeze glass supports, but I know there's many colleagues who think that freezing glass supports would be fine. Many of us would be so lucky to have a way to freeze anything. So that's typically not an issue, but just something to consider. In terms of relative humidity, you want to stay with between 30 and 50% relative humidity with fluctuations under 10% a day. So all of these, um, usually lower is better. So both high temperature and high relative humidity will ac accelerate any uh, deterioration mechanism. And this is sort of like science 101, right? It's just um, heat and humidity just uh, is the perfect combination for accelerating any uh, form of chemical reaction. It also promotes biological growth. So not only mold, but pests. Um, so in terms of improving your environment, you know, those were the ideal conditions. A lot of us can't um, 
really begin to to reach those ideal conditions. But there's a lot you can do. Just you know, don't be deterred by these numbers that can just be very discouraging if you don't have any funds or a way to achieve them. So you really want to look for low hanging fruit. You can do things like closed doors if that would improve your um, conditions. You can open doors if you need more ventilation. Closing blinds, for example. Uh, finding an alternative place in a space in your building. So uh, uh, last year I was in a collection of uh, uh, historical society nearby, and they had this sort of storage room that was, an, was in the middle of the building. So typically you want to avoid ceiling, um, sorry, uh, basements and attics, but this was like in the part of the uh, of the house and it had very stable conditions, very cool and dry. And so they, di they didn't have to do anything. They would just have to move their uh, most um, reactive materials to that one room. So you can you can find creative ways to um, really make a positive change. And then organization, for example, these two examples here on the top, you see this messy drawer. I mean, even just tidying that up would make this such a big difference for these materials that right now they're, they're on top of each other. They're, they're, every time someone opens the door, they're moving all over the place. So little things like organization doesn't necessarily cost money, cost step, step capacity, of course, but there's a lot you can do. And then for example, here you have these um, metal clips that are um, corroding the paper and, and with larger negatives, they're, just, they're actually compressing them and marking them. So just taking those off would be, be a, a, good, a good improvement. Uh, in terms of data loggers, there's paid services you can use like Conserve or Hobo, there's others. But uh, I also often recommend inexpensive data loggers. So this is not an endorsement, but I buy these um, $25 uh, data loggers online that they have access to Wi-Fi. You can download the CSV file. They have very uh, long memory. So there's, uh, if you can't afford the, the, the best, you know, more uh, paid services, you could just have one of these. Place and then you can download it. Um, it used to be that, uh, so a climate notebook until I think it, it's changing as we speak. So a climate notebook is an excellent tool uh, to analyze environmental data that was created by the Image Permanence Institute. Uh, it used to be free, it's still free, but I believe it's going to stop being free very soon, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know of an alternative as of yet, uh, but you know, it could be that that's something you invest um, some money into getting a membership. And the, the great thing about eClimate Notebook is that you upload your data logger data. So the inexpensive data logger I mentioned can be uploaded here as a CSV file. And then you can just play with these uh, values. So you can see if I say lowered the temperature by these many uh, degrees, how would that affect my, um, the chemical decay, biological decay and things like that. So sometimes you could look at this and say, okay, I can't lower my humidity, but I can, um, lower my temperature or vice versa. You know, I can install a standalone dehumidifier um, and, and see where that brings you down. So monitoring your environment um, and you have a lifetime to, to achieve improvement. So start by monitoring, start by looking at your data and see how you can um, improve it. In terms of cold storage, uh, color materials are really the ones to consider. Um, well, color materials and acetate, so is acetate that start to decay. Um, cold storage can be as big as a designated vault, or it can be as simple as um, a, a, a household fridge. Um, if you go to this website and it's on your resources, this is from the National Park Service, it's a great resource for how to um, implement cold storage for, for you know, different budgets. Um, the main thing with cold storage really is the um, condensation issues. And there's a C2CC great webinar by Mark McCormick Goodhart, who together with Henry Wilhelm really pr proposed this idea of um, lower temperatures as the key to preservation. And they developed a way to make, um, just to use regular residential uh, freezers for uh, your collection. So when you think of levels of protection in the collection, you want to think of, you know, you're building your HVAC, that's your outer level of protection, then you have your shelving in your drawer, then a container in the box, and finally the individual sleeve uh, or envelope. In terms of furniture and shelves, you, you probably all know that ideally you want to avoid wood, but this is not always possible in all collections. So if you must have wood um, uh, storage um, uh, shelves, uh, sometimes placing an interleaving layer like a sheet of mylar between the shelf and your materials can, can really 
uh, help prevent a lot of damage. Powder, powder coated metal are the best types of, um, of, of shelves typically, but even these can rust. So you wanna look for any, any, uh, types, any uh, signs of rust you might have. And uh, ventilation is important. So it, it's, there's a, a balance you need to find in your storage or in your space between keeping the space enclosed and contained or when, when do you need ventilation? If you have something that's off gassing or if you have a situation of mold outbreak, is it preferred to um, increase ventilation? So these are new shelves, they're great, they're ideal. Uh, here is a situation where you had uh, metal coated shelves that were very old and they were already rusting. And then there was the, a, a ceiling leak that was just corroding through this, um, this uh, top of this drawer and they put a bucket in there. So hopefully by now this will have been fully improved. And then uh, you want to consider the whole picture. So for example, here is a collection that was uh, all rehoused with four flap um, envelopes, but the, 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 the doors are too stuffed. So this could promote breakage. So really think about pressure, uh, breaking it down into smaller modules. Um, you want to use materials that have passed the photographic materials, uh, the photographic activity test. Uh, don't blindly trust archival or acid-free materials that you find in craft stores. Uh, check archival products and websites that oftentimes the price isn't that different. They have promotions. So um, yeah, don't overstuff uh, um, boxes. Consider a weight limit and choose a housing material that works for you. So papers oftentimes, uh, it's a softer material, but sometimes if you have a collection you need to have access to, um, you, you might need mylar. And then you need to think about maintenance. Okay, in terms of conservation treatments, when do you call a conservator? Um, you know, there's a lot you can be do, do in house. So uh, first of all, you, you want to know, know proper handling um, practices. You want to work in a clean, uncluttered area. You want to work with clean, dry hands or nitrile gloves. We discourage the use of cotton gloves, and we can get into that in the Q and A. And use PPE if necessary. So if you have a lot of off, off gassing, nitrate and silos acetate gases are toxic to humans. So you want to wear a respirator. And some original housing can, can be fine. Not everything needs to be replaced. So you can train your staff to do some surface cleaning, stabilization of glass supports, rehousing, and digitization. And you want to know what is and isn't damaged. So these the, these examples here that I'm showing here and here, these are not damaged. This is actually original to the um, to the negative. These are masks, and these are uh, retouching with graphite on a collodion uh, negative. To find a conservator, the American Institute for Conservation has the uh, find a conservator tool. Conservators can do things like consolidating uh, broken glass plate negatives, uh, do emulsion stripping. So highly deteriorated uh, cellulose acetate can be uh, separated from the image layer. This is a very costly treatment, but it can be done. And there are chemical treatments that in very specific cases can be used. So this is uh, what's called uh, intensification treatments that you see here. Like you can see, there was nothing to be seen on the negative. So in this very specific case, you might consider doing the intensification. These are very costly, highly specialized treatments. There are companies that do things like the duplication. So the Chicago Albumin Works, uh, they're one of the foremost companies doing duplication and uh, negative stripping. You can find companies to do mold remediation and um, any type of biological infestation. Things that cannot be done are things like reverse losses, uh, losses, any breakage. So you're always going to see where there was a break. Most of the discoloration cannot be reversed and staining most typically cannot be reversed. Um, for disaster response, uh, I'm sure there's um, a, se a seminar already on that, but some materials will not survive. And if you have a good uh, emergency plan, you'll be able to address um, your disaster response. Um, you want to be mindful to have contacts that allow you to freeze materials because um, most photographic materials will not survive over 48 hours of um, water immersion. Uh, so these are some key takeaways. Uh, identification is key. You want to know what you have, make a plan, start with achievable goals. Uh, remember that small changes can have a great impact. So things like cleaning, keeping the space organized and monitoring, low temperature and dry environments, are ideal um, and you're not alone. A lot of people have uh, the same issues you have with your negatives. So this is my contact, feel free to ask questions. And I think I just made it into 45 minutes. <laughs> you're pretty dang close. <laughs> so I think you did excellently. Thanks so much, Louisa. Uh, just a quick note that I just put a link in the chat to our resources. 
and to the survey, the resources link is actually going to lead you to a copy of Luis's entire presentation um, and a link of the curated resources, which a lot of time was kind of put into gathering both um, what, like what kind of resources might be useful to you all. The funding resources I think are really interesting, so I'm always happy to share those. Um, and I'm also going to note that we have a survey link in there as well. So if you guys could take a few minutes to do the survey before the end of the program, it would be appreciated as well. Well, we already have questions, which is good. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do our last 10 minutes answering some of those. I'm going to start kind of at the top and then pick and choose some. Um, one of our first questions is, are manufacturers still making film with polyester? Yes, there's a very, I, um, I don't know off the top of my head, I can pr provide some, but it's now, um, it's very limited. But yes, there's still, I believe Kodak, I think Ilford, a few companies still, but very small runs. Excellent, thanks. Um, someone asks, can AD strips also determine if certain types of photographs, photographic prints are deteriorating? No, they are specific. So the dye that changes color specifically reacts with acetic acid. So, I mean, there might be materials that have um, cellulose acetate in them, like a coating, some uh, resin coated papers might have. Um, so anything with, the, with a cellulose acetate breaking down would test positive, but they're really just for uh, negatives. Perfect, thanks. Um, going back to the storage, so you showed some really good pictures of just how to store these types of items. If film slash negatives are placed in an envelope, is it better if they are standing up or laying down flat? And how many pieces do you think are in an envelope, just roughly? Yeah, so I would say you want to do individual envelopes if you can, that's ideal. Um, and in terms of the upright flat, that's that's sort of a, a choice. So smaller formats, you can usually put in a binder with mylar. If you're doing individual, um, say, four flap envelopes, I mean, uh, so when I worked in archives, we'd prefer to buy a smaller box uh, that would fit, say, 20 negatives, but that adds up in terms of cost. But ideally upright, uh, ideally smaller per box. If something is starting to sag, uh, you could put sort of like pieces of cardboard to separate. Um, it's, it's almost sort of a, a case by case, but I think four by five and up, um, let's see, four by five, I think it's fine to be, uh, upright, but then when you get anything bigger than, so an eight by 10, you want flat. That and then you sense. want to not overstuff them. So the pressure on the bottom one isn't, um, too great. I know it's always so hard because you're, you, and then you're also fighting against the whole, like, everything this all costs money <laughs> like it is not cheap and especially if you get good quality things so i know it's hard to find that balance of you don't want to hurt the objects but you don't want to overstuff i mean i know i've walked into plenty of photography collections across the board and sometimes you look at a couple of the binders or boxes and you're a little like that's a little tight you know what i mean but i get that you're trying to play against that whole cost yeah. issue so understandable um, someone asks, is there anything you would recommend using to clean glass supports? Glass supports. So glass supports, first of all, you need to know that you're on the right side of, that you're not cleaning the emulsion side, which can also be cleaned, but the emulsion, I would say a conservator has to clean them. The, the glass support you can typically um, clean with just distilled water and cotton. But when you're cleaning it, there's a few measures. Um, you know, ideally you want to have training. So when you clean, um, a glass plate, if there's um, sometimes there's blind cracks that you can't really see and just the smallest amount of moisture will expand and make the negative crack or uh, sometimes just a little bit too much pressure of the hand can cause the negatives to crack. So ideally you wanna have some training before you jump into doing something like that. And most conservators will offer, you know, one day training uh, of your staff. So um, yeah, I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> No, that's good. And um, we just yeah. had a question pop in, which is kind of related, which says, is there a public list of conservators or conservation companies that offer freezing services? That's two different things. So conservators, right? I would recommend using our find a professional tool on the website, right? And I know even this word of mouth, sometimes you'll end up finding people in the region, but I would always refer people to that. For companies that offer freezing services, if you don't know off the top of your head, and I want to get your take on this, Louisa, I would almost I really try to reach don't. out. I was to thinking like I know that uh, Polygon freezes. Uh, Polygon is a disaster response company, and they freeze as a disaster response. But you pay. Uh, typically, you freeze until you can treat them. 
So it's not sort of like a long-term storage, I don't think. That's the one that comes to mind is Polygon. I don't know of any um, institutions that commercially freeze collections long-term, uh, but yeah. I can look into it. Yeah, the other thing I would do is um, reach out to local like libraries, like especially university libraries. Sometimes they have good connections to that area because they deal with stuff in bulk as compared to mm -hmm. museums. So I would recommend reaching out to those folks as well. Um, okay, what are some of the, uh, this is a good one. What are some of the best practices for properly disposing of damaged acetate negatives, channelization and vinegar syndrome that we have deaccessioned? That's a very good point. Please deaccession the items before you uh, try to get rid of them. But do you have any recommendations on how to do that? Actually, I, I actually have no idea. I've never encountered that. Um, I would say when you have actively deteriorating materials, they're, they're toxic to humans, so isolate them in bags. Um, I would say it's probably the same as with nitrate, I would suspect, or um, any sort of like chemical you need to dispose of. So that's probably you need to look, but I've never encountered that. That's a new one to me that someone would dispose of them. Yeah. Um, so I actually don't know, but I can look into that. And that's totally fine. This is a, but that's a common, just take a step back. Like a lot of collections people, and again, I'm a registrar by training. Um, we talk, I've always been a big proponent of deaccessioning. If things don't belong in your collection, do it. But when you get to that disposal question, it's always like, great, great. You can deaccession it, but outside of transferring stuff to other institutions or the original donors, when it comes to true destruction of materials that turns into a much grayer area so that might be a, yeah. a topic for a future webinar especially because point. it's sort of a, a sort of a, a toxic hazard so I think you have to dispose of it as you would any toxic material so but I, I've never encountered it so I'll definitely look into it because it's a very interesting point very good um are the plastic negative storage pages e.g things you get from print file which I know I've seen appropriate for storage they are appropriate, and that's what I was trying to say. There isn't sort of like, uh, you have to find what works for you. So I've been in collections where everything went to paper four flap envelopes, but they need to open them all the time. So in that case, you, you can, um, you know, use the transparent so long as it's past the PAT. Uh, some people put their binders, instead of putting them with the metal, uh, with the rings to the side, they put them to the top, so the sheets are hanging there's hanging systems so then you don't have the problem of them sagging which is the main problem but yeah they're totally fine the thing with mylar is that, that some people don't like is that usually mylar sleeves are um more compacted so when you slide your object you can uh you know you can risk scratching them abrading them there's lint can get trapped so that's one of the reasons there's uh you know properly used there's no reason not to use them perfect um, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to get through as many questions as I could. So it's going to be a little rapid fire. So apologies. How should you store plastic rolls of film? I know I've come across those in collections as well. Yes. Yeah, so in, in, in most, if you want to use rolled film, you're going to have to flatten them. And this is something you do. It has to be a conservator to humidify and flatten them. They're very, wait, that was a red, a red cardinal hitting my window. Um, so yeah, you'd have to contact the conservator to flatten them. They're not going to flatten on themselves and you don't want to pry them open because that poses risk. So unfortunately with uh, roll film, uh, you really have to contact the conservator and typically the only way to do it is to humidify and flatten them. Um, and it, it is costly. Until you get a conservator, do you, would you recommend just keeping them stored in their rolled film situation and just I mean, there's them? really nothing else you can do. You know, sometimes people force them into sleeves, but they don't. Like they, they, so this is one, like th there's no, this is my study collection. It's not a collection piece. Uh, there's no way, you know, even if, if you force them into a sheet, they're not gonna stay, they're gonna wanna curl. It's a combination of the plastic and the gelatin. So really, it, it really has to be humidified and flattened. Um, unfortunately, yeah. But in the meantime, yes, by all means, keep them rolled. Uh, don't handle them too much. If they're in their little um, sort of, Kodak housing, that, that should be fine because all those materials were tested at the time to be inert. Um, but yeah, okay. I would say just keep them keep them rolled until you can flatten them. Yeah, I mean, that I was wanted to get your opinion on that because that's what my gut tells me is just leave them be. <laughs> like, yeah, until because like, yeah. I wouldn't want to force them, you know what I mean? So I would just leave them be. Um, okay, so for a final question, what is your opinion on storing acetate negatives? 
in polyester or modern good quality plastic sleeves. There is a risk of acid buildup, but paper options are often much more expensive. Yeah, so I, I don't have an issue with this. Like I was saying, in terms of physical damage is what um, I, was, I was mentioning. So I just want to be mindful. And, and also, um, you know, ventilation is going to be key for a room like that where you, you're worried about um, acid buildup. Um, get the AD strips. You know, if you place AD strips and treat them like you would um, your insect traps, you know, and check them once a month and see if they've changed, you need to do something about where, uh, but otherwise, um, if there's ventilation, if the room isn't too hot, it, sh it should be fine. Perfect. Um, we had a question come in about scanning. We do have webinars dealing with digitization and kind of that whole aspect. That is a very different topic than what we're kind of talking about today, which is the storing of the film and negatives. But I would encourage you to go to our website, type in digitization, and a whole lot of stuff's going to pop up. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I'm going to leave you with this last question because I think it is a good one. How long can the negatives last? in your opinion? If you freeze them, they can, according to Henry Wilhelm, they can last forever. <laughs> if you freeze them. Perfect. All right, so thanks everyone for joining us for today's program. Um, it was great. It was a lot of information, but this topic is very heavy. So we really appreciate you getting it into a 45 minute uh, presentation. I again, put a link to our resources and the survey link in the chat. So I encourage you to go check that out. Um, we will be back in July with our next webinar about just choosing storage, and we'll be posting soon about some other things. Louisa, thanks so much for doing this today. Um, and thank you huge, so much. You bet. And a huge thank you uh, to IMLS, who supports our program, and FAIC, as always. We will see you all in July, and I hope everyone has a good start of their summer. Thanks.